thank you all for joining us today. This is the student showcase on confronting the plastics crisis. Um, this is part of a plastics policy policy workshop that Rachel Karasik, um, in your research associate at the Nicholas Institute organized. Um, we have a great lineup. So this is part of a larger workshop bringing together researchers from Dalhousie University. We have Dr. Tony Walker here. You wouldn't mind this giving <laughs> <laughs> Researchers from the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, which is a little late in Norway right now. So maybe they're online if they're brave, but I, I'm not quite convinced of that. Um, we have Dr. Steve Fletcher and Antia March from the University of Portsmouth Global Plastics Policy Center and some sh shameless advertising for another event that you'll probably find interesting. We have a lunch and learn um, coming up on, oh, apologies. We have a lunch and learn coming up. This is the wrong advertisement, but we have a <laughs> this is advertisement for the event you're at. Um, you're here, so that seems a little unnecessary, but there's going to be a lunch and learn on Thursday um, with these folks from Fort Smith talking about everything from using enzymes to biodegrade plastic to fashion um, and transdiscipl uh, transdisciplinary perspectives for addressing the plastic crisis. So a little bit about um, some of what we have going on at Duke here. So uh, right before the COVID pandemic, myself and some other folks uh, founded this plastic pollution working group. We're an open group, so if you're not yet a part of it, you're welcome to join. We right now have 50 members across 13 departments, ranging from the Department of History to the Cancer Institute, everything in between. Um, and we're comprised of faculty, students, staff, and now some alumni as well. And if you don't know me yet, um, I'm a PhD candidate here at Duke. I'm defending in a week, so that alumni bucket will go up one. I'm in marine science and conservation. Um, and my research focus is on interdisciplinary perspectives of plastic pollution. So just to give you an idea, these are the range of the different groups that are involved in the plastic pollution working group. Um, we have quite a mighty group here. And we set up on this mission to apply an interdisciplinary approach to better understand plastic pollution issues, to inform equitable and effective solutions. And we want to be this convening space serving as a central hub for students, staff, faculty, learners at all levels who are interested in plastic pollution. Um, and I think this event here today is really a great um, sort of uh, microcosm of that. We have students at all levels from different perspectives who are going to be presenting on plastic pollution and their research. So one more shameless plug for the working group. Um, check out our updated website and we have a uh, recent special issue we came out with as well with uh, these different papers. We have classic from a one health perspective and environmental justice perspective and so on. And uh, we're on social media. So you can stay up to date of uh, events like this that are going on um, as well as some of our latest research and highlighting researchers and so on um, through, that, through that manner. So what are we doing today? Um, we're starting off, there have been many different technologies that have been proposed and invented with the explicit aim of addressing plastic pollution. Um, there's already so much waste in the environment and waste that's ending up in landfills. So we'll first hear from Madison Griffin, who will be talking about plastic cleanup technologies. And um, are they working? What are some gaps in the effect of these measures? Then we'll be hearing about a Duke Recycling Center. So focusing in on campus um, from Jill and Arnoff. We'll be switching gears and then moving into the arts, looking at using humor to talk about microplastics and then ending with policy. So reducing single use plastics here in North Carolina, as well as strengthening the evidence base and looking at are these policies actually working? And with that, I will be handing it off. So, Madison. So, Madison Griffin is a Durham native and a biology major. She has minors in environmental science and policy and education. Spent the past two years working with the Plastic Pollution Working Group, as well as folks at the Nicholas Institute studying plastic pollution. She's been working to increase diversity in STEM for two years by, co de by developing curriculum for the Health and Environment Scholars Program which is co-led by Nicholas Institute staff. 
Outside of class and research, Madison is a member of Lady Blue, one of Duke's all female identifying acapella groups. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joy, for the introduction. Again, hi, I'm Madison. Um, thank you so much for coming. And today, I'm going to talk about my research about the gaps in cleanup effectiveness and ecological impact of plastic cleanup technology. So, my research is a follow up to this paper that came out in 2020. Uh, this research group is from Duke and they created the Plastic Pollution Prevention and Collection Technology Inventory as a way to compile um, innovative solutions out there, technologies that are trying to clean up plastic pollution around the world. This is on the Nicholas Institute website. I encourage you guys to check it out after this session. So what is a technology? For our research, we defined it as devices that reduce the amount of plastic pollution. I think they can't see your slides. Oh. <laughs> So yeah, um, we define technology as devices that reduce the amount of plastic pollution from entering oceans and rivers, or extract existing plastic pollution from waterways, including those that aim to prevent plastic pollution from entering waters upstream of oceans and rivers. What's really cool is this can look like a lot of different things. So I'll just give two examples now. Um, this is the Hula One. It can vacuum sand and debris and then separate plastic from sand based on their buoyancy. This is based out of Canada. And then this is the great bubble barrier. It uses tubes on the bottom of a waterway and through pumping air, it creates this bubble barrier that creates a current to bring debris to the surface and guide it to the catchment system. So a lot of different diversity and technology going on here. So getting into how we found these technologies, this was a very big literature review. We reviewed non-peer-reviewed literature and um, streamed these news articles, business websites, et cetera, to find new technologies update technologies that were already there and extract non-peer-reviewed effectiveness data. And then we did a similar thing for peer-reviewed literature. So finding any new technologies, extracting peer-reviewed effectiveness data and ecological impact. And then we created these effectiveness metrics, which I'll talk about later in slides, to analyze that effectiveness data. So these are some of the parameters we looked at. The table on the left shows what was already studied in Schmaltz, but um, when I started this project, I was really interested in figuring out if these technologies were really effective or just is there research on what these technologies can actually do? Where are they implemented? Do they have any impacts? And just seeing what's out there. So that's really what my study focuses on. So first I'll walk you through just the results from updating the inventory and how we did those analyses. There were 47 technologies in the original paper and we added 56 in 22. So now there's a total of 109 technologies in the inventory, which is really exciting. Um, and of the ones that were in the original paper, 31 are still in use today, and three progressed to being in use, and even one progressed to being in testing phases. So this really shows how the world is moving forward and getting more technologies out there and implementing them in waterways. Of the technologies, 79 of them are collection technologies and 24 are prevention. And as you can see by the green, a lot of these technologies are in use, which is again, really, really exciting. Even more exciting, significantly more technologies have been invented over time. So in 1964, there was only one recorded technology being invented that year, but in 2020, which you can't see, that's now up to 24. So again, you can really see this increasing and my data is up to mid 2022. That's when my data collection stops. So I'm sure if you went back now, you could see it's still increasing and not really a drop off there. So again, there's a global push for getting these technologies out there. And these technologies are implemented around the world. So the most of them are in the United States, Indonesia and Australia. But if you account for the fact that a lot of these technologies target plastic and waterways, you can see in this map that a lot of the coastal countries have at least one technology implemented. So again, a global issue with global solutions. And 73 of the technologies that were in use reported where they are. So now I'll get into more detail about the effectiveness metrics. This is how we created a description of the language used to report the effectiveness data in both peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed sources. So the first one is total amount of plastic collected or removed. And that is exactly what it sounds like. It's the total amount of plastic, but 
important to note here is that it's over an unspecified number of collections and over a larger time scale. So for example, since, start, since starting operation in October 2020, Sumga sample trash barriers have collected 650,000 kilograms of plastic. Very similarly, there's an amount per mission. The difference here is that now there's a specific number of collections happening and over a smaller time scale. So example, each clear box can collect up to one ton per day. There's also a percent capture and efficiency. Again, just like how it sounds, usually a percentage that reports plastic removal, plastic capture, or efficiency rate of the technology. So for example, the core wall removes at least 31% of microfibers that would have otherwise flowed out of a washing machine. There are also targets. These are a cleanup objective or goal to reach within the next few years. So for example, the goal of the ocean cleanup project is to be able to remove 90% of floating ocean plastic by 2040. And lastly, there are technological limits. So these are any physical limit of a technology, whether it pertains to battery life, how long it can go, weight capacity, how far it can go in one trip, et cetera. So for example, each unit of the waste shark can run, has a runtime of about seven to eight hours. So let's apply these to non-peer reviewed effects. This is affecting this data from news articles, business websites, theses, policy briefs, and reports. So we found that 58 of our technologies actually have this non-peer reviewed data, but we can see that the technology types that are studied in that way is very different. So technology types like river booms, technologies that go inside your laundry machine, boats and wheels, those are studied a lot in terms of their effectiveness. As we can see over on the left, uh, miscellaneous leakage protection, miscellaneous capture, drones and robots, those technologies aren't studied in terms of their effectiveness as much as the others. And if we talk about the way that they are reporting this effectiveness, we found that there's 102 total reports of effectiveness. This is a single data point. As you can imagine, one technology can have multiple data for effectiveness. And the language is pretty equitably used, except for target. When we look at it on a larger scale across technology types, we can see there's a lot going on. Across the board, a lot of different technologies are using different ways to report their data. Even within technology types, there's different language, different statistics being used. There's no real consistency in how the world is talking about the effectiveness of this technology. So this shows that not only is there a research gap in studying what, how effective technologies are, this is limiting the application of these technologies because there's inconsistency in the language used to report that. These measurements are pretty incomparable if they're not on the same scale, which makes it hard to think about how you can apply these in the real world and make decisions about where these technologies can go. And again, we see that targets aren't really used as a metric to define effectiveness in non-peer-reviewed data. So now let's do the same thing for our peer-reviewed effectiveness. This is effectiveness that has been validated by journal editors and research scholars. And so we found that only 11 of our technologies had both non-peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed effectiveness. Um, so we hypothesized that the non-peer-reviewed effectiveness might be greater than the peer-reviewed due to potential bias in, say, news articles and business websites, trying to get people to buy their technology. This was actually only true for these four technologies, and five of them actually disproved our hypothesis. For three, the effectiveness reports were the same for both sources. And for the bottom two, the peer reviewed effectiveness was actually greater. So the bias we expected wasn't really seen here. But going back to the effectiveness metrics in that language, as we can see by this pie chart, in the peer reviewed data, people are reporting this um, heavily on percent capture and efficiency. Then again, looking at it from technology type level, again, keeping in mind only 11 technologies are represented here, but it is a lot more standard across the board and within technology types. So what we know from here is not only is there an extreme gap in technologies being studied in a peer-reviewed rigorous way, there is more standardized language though within the technology types, making it very easy to compare technologies to each other and make executive decisions. Um, and this is actually already being done in papers that have been released very recently, beginning of this year, late last year, that came out after this study. People are using this um, percent capture and efficiency to compare technology types to each other to help better inform decision making. And as we saw, the non peer reviewed effectiveness is less biased than we expected. The last thing I'm going to talk about is ecological impact. We had positive, neutral, and negative ecological impact. And this is under the assumption of in addition to the assumed benefit of a technology removing plastic from the environment. 
So only five technologies had ecological impact data. So again, another gap in understanding how these technologies can impact their environment aside from just cleaning up plastic. But for the ones that did, one of them had a positive impact. These magnetic coils, um, they emit some sort of chemical reaction to break down microplastics, but it was found that they can serve as a carbon source for algae growth. Mr. Trashfield had a neutral ecological impact, um, even though it was found that wildlife can get on that conveyor belt you see in that picture, it moves slowly enough that they didn't escape before entering the dumpster inside. But um, three technologies were found to have pretty negative impacts. Um, the sea bin shown in the bottom has a lot of um, animal bycatch. The ocean cleanup system, it was found that zooplankton can be killed from encountering the skirts of the trawl that it has. And then for clean trash, um, when encountered, encountering strong winds and high waves, the technology can actually endanger the environment around it. So some of the suggestions that we found to kind of mitigate these negative ecological impacts are for more active cleanup technologies to pull them very slowly, avoid feeding grounds of megafauna like whales and sharks, and to try to only skim the surface. And though that would be better for reducing negative ecological impacts, that might actually reduce the efficiency of cleaning up the plastic itself because these feeding grounds of the surface tend to be where the plastic is just based on how ocean currents work. So complex issue, but the data is kind of got there. So moving forward into the future, I started this, I ended this data collection in mid-2022. And even since then, there's been so much more technology being written about. We get a lot of emails being like, add this to our inventory, please. So this is a very big global effort. So we have to continue to update this inventory and make it public for not just the public to know, but other stakeholders and governments to really make these decisions. And if we're going to do that, we first have to fill these gaps in effectiveness data and ecological impact. For these new solutions to really have the impact that we intend them to do, we have to know how they work and what works best in different situations. And the way that we think we can do that is to standardize the language in which it is reported, make it so it's very easy to compare them, apply it to different situations around the world. So say you can say that this technology would be great for the plastic crisis in Kenya, but this one would be better for what we're seeing in North Carolina. Stuff like that for moving forward. But um, I'm writing a paper about this, so be on the lookout. I'm hoping to get it published soon. But um, with that, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great work. Um, can you say a little bit more about this? Are, are these all pretty much just like a testing phase, or are there any areas where the technology really didn't scale up? have a pretty significant interception rate for plastics in a particular area. I think they are beginning to have that impact, but again, the data is not really out there yet, at least for what I saw when I was doing the data collection, but I think some of the more popular technologies say, but this blue thing on the on the far right, that's, I actually just saw that at the experiment like the other day. You put it in your laundry machine, it's supposed to catch the microfibers inside, and those are sold everywhere. Um, there are kind of bigger technology being used at a local scale, but I just don't think the data is published about that yet, but it's starting to be. Yeah. yeah thanks, Matt. So this is great work. I know there's going to be a, a big audience for this when it, when it comes out. I'm just curious, have you seen, of, of the technologies that you have in there, how many of them are used specifically for prevention or cleanup in rivers or streams or estuary mouths? And, and is it possible um, to even come up with, say, categories or archetypes of these technologies, maybe some for like microfibers only, or just thinking if that would be easy to do, be curious to see how much of the technology and the innovation is really matched to where we know the big sources of, of leakage are. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think there's around 10 large, well, not large scale, but booms for rivers specifically. And I do think that technology for rivers in particular is also growing as a field because a lot of them early on are more from green sources, but there are ones that can work just for rivers. I don't know the number off the top of my head. I apologize. But for Macroplastic versus microplastic. I don't know the exact numbers, but there are a lot, lot more for macroplastic. And I think that's just because it's very hard to clean up microplastic. Most of the ones for laundry machines and laundry filters are for microplastics, though, coming from um, synthetic fibers in your clothes. But 
yeah, I think it's majority microplastic right now, but there are some interesting ones with microplastic. I'd be happy to talk more about that afterwards. Yeah. This is more just on, about some of the applications, which you've obviously read into quite well, and less about the study, but things like the, the, the coral balls and things like, like microfibers in washing machines and things. Do they then go on to describe how consumers might deal with the waste that it collects? In, in some instances, do they provide provisions for that and how they might dispose of that waste? Or is there a risk that then itself just gets washed down the drain or um, you know, poorly managed? Yeah, so I think that is technology dependent. There's one filter I know of specifically, blanking on the name, but it attaches to the outside of your washing machine. And then they have a system where you would like rotate through devices and you would send it back to them. And then the company will help you dispose of it. But I do think a lot of them, the after part of the collection isn't really talked about for consumer reviews, which is definitely something that should be talked about in more detail on a company end. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, uh, John probably uh, asked a uh, part of the question I was going to ask. Well done. This is great, uh, great topic, great subject, and there will be a massive appetite for your findings. Um, so, of those 102 studies, you already alluded to the fact that very few deal with microplastics, and if they do, in concentration fibers of source in, in your device. Um, I have a student, if you haven't already been connected with um, uh, by Rachel, who's specifically interested in capturing microplastics in a, in a freshwater lake uh, in, in northern Canada, but could have uh, applications everywhere. And she's been in contact with a company, I don't know if you're uh, aware of them, or it's one of those newbies that have come on board after you finish your search, called Polygon, and they're based in, in the States. I think, um, actually, I think Zoe, you just sent that to me, I think, a couple of weeks ago. So not in the study, but I have read the website. So it's one of the ones not included here, but yeah. hopefully add to the inventory. At least, well, something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I want to emphasize on tonight just that we, it was all about it. <laughs> I second that statement. <laughs> So a nice transition there on what do we do with all the waste that we've produced. Um, we are now going to hear from Rochelle Hirabelli and Arnav Singh. We have a presentation on the Duke Plastics Recycling Center and what can we do on campus with some of the plastic waste that we've generated. So Rochelle is a biomedical engineering major from West Hartford, Connecticut. Rochelle enjoys building and creating and has a strong motivation to find solutions that can help the environment. He's involved in computational biology research focused on the immune system and is also a bassist in the Duke Jazz Ensemble. Arnav is a Durham native and a biomedical engineering major. He loves to create devices that can help have a direct and immediate impact on his community. He's involved in campus organizations like Quad X, where he serves as president of the Wanamaker Quad, and Vertices, which is an academic journal that he is senior editor of. So thank you so much. Come on up. Hey everyone, we are DARP, the Duke Advanced Recycling Center. Um, and before we dive in, before we dive in, we have a quick roadmap for you guys today. So what we're gonna start with is give a brief summary of the problem and what we have in mind for our initiative. Then we're gonna dive in and take a closer look at what is the current recycling infrastructure, not only on campus, but just around the world in general. We're also going to look at how dark ourselves, we can address these challenges and have an impact on mitigating the amount of plastic pollution on campus in five different steps. There, we're going to dive into the technical aspects of what makes our organization so specific, stuff like the machine design, the cost, the location, and more broadly, the journey that plastic waste once it enters our organization is going to take to be developed into eventual plastic products. We're going to then discuss the feasibility of such a program and the implementability. Finally, we're going to end with discussing our next steps and where we can go from there. In one sentence, our main goal for our organization is to turn single-use plastic short-life products, such as a plastic water bottle you buy from Costco, that are otherwise thrown out really quickly and in large quantities, into long-term use plastic products, such as a reusable plastic water bottle. What we're planning on doing is creating a plastic recycling workspace here directly on Duke University campus to deal with the pollution we create as a university. 
So what we're trying to do is have campus plastic waste be turned into plastic products. And then our goals are twofold. First, we want to mitigate the actual contribution that UC University has as a whole to the plastic pollution pandemic. And then second, we also want to serve, because we are a research institution, serve as an educational resource for both Duke and the local Durham community to show how plastic can be recycled in such a small scale. The workplace itself is going to consist of a series of machines that are responsible for shredding, that we're going to melt, extrude, and eventually mold plastic to the eventual final products that we desire. We envision this product to be, or this workshop to be cross disciplinary, where whatever the sale of the plastic product we produce is going to be then driven to add it to increase revenue for the workplace itself. We know that often otherwise that there is a large barrier into keeping these things running, but we see that because of the cross disciplinary approach, there's going to be a cyclical approach to the nature where we'll have increased funding from actual work that we do. Finally, there's a lot of research opportunities here at Duke University to learn more about the plastic recycling and then further studies where we can decrease the pollution and increase the sustainability efforts. So now, um, now that we sort of laid out what we are planning on doing with our organization, we're going to dive into a bit of a problem and the challenges with recycling plastic in the status quo. Each year, we produce about 400 million tons of plastic waste, of which only 9% of plastic is recycled. This means the vast majority of the plastic ends up in landfills, it's incinerated, or ends up in our ecosystem, like um, the oceans or, or um, various different parts of our ecosystem. Um, since 1980, plastic production has grown tremendously. However, the plastic recycling rate has remained relatively constant. And by 2050, our plastic um, production is expected to increase three times but it looks like our recycling rate is going to remain relatively constant. So why is our recycling rate relatively short? Well, recycling facilities in the status quo have to manage all different types of plastic, or all different types of waste. This includes things like paper, glass, aluminum, as well as plastic. And so what this does is it makes sorting plastic becoming very difficult and labor intensive. Oftentimes the plastic is not clean, it's not put in a proper state for it to be easily recycled. And as a result of that, a lot of the plastic that people do put it in these recycling bins, ends up going into the landfills. Also, the recycling plastic is less durable and is more expensive. What this means is that companies are have less of an incentive to use recycled plastic when they're developing their new products. And so this means the recycling plastic market is uh, relatively um, small. Another thing is that the US tends to, export, um, tends to export its plastic waste to other countries. And so, what the, and so, but in 2017, countries like China and Thailand, which have taken a lot of US um, plastic, um, plastic waste, have banned these exports. What this means is that there's a lot of plastic waste here domestically in the United States. And a lot of places don't have the proper recycling infrastructure to handle all of this waste. And as a result, a lot of this waste does end up in the landfills, it does end up polluting our environment. So, what does this mean at the individual level? How does this affect us on a day-to-day -day basis? As we all are aware, like the whole concept of recycling has been sort of harped at us since we, since we were young and in college and even in the workplace. And so what this does is it creates a false, um, false impression that we are recycling plastic. But the reality of the situation is a lot of this plastic that we think is being recycled ends up going um, into the landfills and into our ecosystem as pollution. There's this thing called wish cycling where people put like items that they think that they can be recycled into the recycling bin when the reality of the situation is this like recycled is probably not going to be recycled. So how is our organization going to address some of these issues that we see with the current infrastructure and recycling and elastic? So we have sort of this five impact framework, waste diversion, waste reduction, environmental equity, research and innovation, community influence, and a bit more on each of these. What we mean by waste diversion is that we're going to divert waste that we're otherwise end up in landfills and oceans through recycling center that we have here on campus. What this does is that we're going to broadly limit the plastic pollution that Duke University as a whole contributes to the environment. We also see that we can limit carbon emissions as the vast majority, um, as the vast majority of like plastic also does get incinerated as well. Here we also have our second impact waste reduction. And so what this means is this is where sort of our educational component of our organization is going to play a part. We're going to sort of educate individuals and provide them with resources how to properly recycle plastic. We also have, since we are going to like recycle plastic in our center, it's going to have an hands-on approach. And oftentimes you see that hands-on approaches 
tend to inspire people. This also means that we're not just limiting to how we can recycle, but also go back to the first principles of like what it means to also reduce our plastic consumption and how we can reuse plastic waste that we also have. We also have um, environment time. Since the US tends to export a lot of its plastic waste to other countries, we are putting the burden of our waste on other countries who aren't even really contributing to the plastic pollution. And what this does is that we are put the burden on these countries when the burden should be in place on the people who are actually contributing to um, the pollution. And so what this community recycling waste approach does is that it provides environmental justice. Lastly, um, research and innovations, it provides opportunities for students to be in the plastic recycling space. This could also be look like improving recycling machinery, creating new plastic products, and also creating alternatives to plastic. Lastly, um, we have community influence. Should we be able to create a very successful recycling sector here on campus, we can inspire other communities to take action on recycling. This could include other university campuses, local neighborhoods, and communities in the developing world as well. So now we're going to go into some of the feasibility and technicality. Um, prior to us, there's this organization called the Precious Plastic Organization that has already done sort of plastic recycling at a small scale. They created machines as shown here that have turned into products as shown on the right. Um, we, this has also been done at other universities as well, such as Monash University in Australia, Ohio State University, University of Houston. And so these are some of the devices that specifically Monash University has created to recycle plastic. And as you can see, it's a very compact device that can really be transported, really be used at a small scale. Here we envision that we have two types of recycling machinery, we have low fidelity machinery, high fidelity machinery. This low fidelity machinery is machinery that can be produced at a simple, um, produce, a simple machinery is produced at a simple cost, which is developed right away. Um, it does require more manual labor and limited skill, which is where the high fidelity machinery allows us to create a way more level of diverse products. And if there's more automation, there's a great amount of Some of this low fidelity machinery looks like turning plastic water bottles into plastic string and also creating um, tote bags um, and rope as well. Yeah, and tote bags. Some of the high fidelity machinery products look like some of these um, as shown here. And as you can see, they're far more diverse. Um, in terms of steps, in terms of how we want to um, recycle plastic, there are several like steps we need to sort of go over here. One is obviously plastic collection. This is going to involve sort of different actors that we have here on Duke and how we're going to collect the plastic waste from them. Um, the second is sorting. How are we going to be able to sort this um, plastic based off color, but based off different plastic type? Next is cleaning the plastic. One option is to clean the plastic in order for it to be recycled is hand washing it. There's also a clever system where you can like shred the plastic first and then wash it in sort of like a washing machine with the trash. We also have shredding, so we're going to um, shred the plastic into smaller pieces. This is what allows it to be a lot easier to melt and mold the plastic using um, an injector is one way um, where you put pellets into a heated barrel and inject it into the mold. Um, there's also a compressor which would make it like flat sheets of plastic, um, as well as also an extruder where you can turn plastic and make it into a tube. In terms of how like how much it would cost for all these machines, um, sort of this is an outline of all of that. That's us. We'd love to hear from you guys all. Any questions or comments you might have, we're happy to field them. This is a great example of uh, the, the community as a living lab, because uh, you've got the solution and the education and the increased awareness, which hopefully will change uh, everybody's behavior on campus and beyond. Um, so that's awesome. Um, did, uh, will you, because have you done this yet? Or is it still conceptual? No, so we're right now in the process of receiving $25,000 in grant funding and immediately upon approval, we hope to buy the products and the machines so we can start getting the center set up. So that's what we're waiting on right now. So. Okay, excellent. So then my next question to that then is when you get it set up next week, uh, let's say, um, have you uh, got uh, a, a system already established then on how you'll separate PET from, you know, other types of, uh, you know, uh, resin uh, codes? And then even within PET, what, how are you going to deal with dyes? So like uh, you can have uh, clear PET bottles and then occasionally you might get, so you're going to separate that too. 
Yeah, so there, obviously we're still sort of, sort of ideating how we want to do all of that. I think our main focus is to, instead of like collecting a broad sort of aspect of all types of plastic, as you mentioned, like focus on sort of one type of plastic as we start off. And then as, as you mentioned, like sort the plastic waste in terms of different colors and then sort of recycle it down, downstream from there. Another idea that we've also thought about is specifically recycling 3D plastic waste, um, 3D printer plastic waste. Um, and so, especially at Duke and a lot of universities, there's a lot of waste that's produced just off of 3D printers. And so that's also another sort of plastic area that we focus on is recycling that yeah. as well. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. One is like, have you done any outreach with like Duke administration since I feel like it fits into a lot of like the Duke um, climate commitment goals of like waste management on campus? Um, my other one was like, um, whether it'll only be limited to on campus waste since you said like um, it would have some impacts on the community. And like obviously you said, Duke is a big contributor to waste in Durham, uh, but also waste in Durham is also funnels into. Um, like a place like dump in Samson County in Eastern North Carolina. Um, that's an environmental justice. Community. Yeah, absolutely. So, in, to answer your first question, so we actually applied for the grant funding under the Climate Sustainability Grant. So, right under, like, as soon as President Price had, uh, announced that, that's what we applied for. Um, so, we'd already identified several sources of like, plastic revenue on campus. One of the main ones is going to be Duke Dining in the Freedom Center. So we've been talking with their head rabbi, so they have their weekly Shabbat dinners, and they produce a lot of plastic. So in our conversation with them, they've expressed strong interest to recycle out a small scale of plastic they produce and create a sustainable revenue where they can create new plastic products for their use at their weekly Shabbat dinners. The issue with Duke Dining is at, it's very decentralized in the sense that every different vendor you see on Duke, there's like seven different ones. They all send their plastic to like a different collection program. And so the issue with that is not only is there increased costs for Duke University as a whole, because they have to be shipping these metric tons out to all these different distribution centers, but also that it's decentralized because we don't have good numbers on who's producing how much. So what we hope to create out of this is by right, recycling on campus, we can essentially create like Duke's first ever climate sustainability plastic budget. And if we can identify that, okay, where are the big sources of plastic coming from? And then from there, we can create policy changes to decrease that. To answer your second question about the local Durham community, so one of the main things we've identified is along with outreach with local Durham County Public Schools is with the creation of these tote bags. So you can essentially press plastic and press cloth over it to create reusable tote bags. So one thing we have identified with local shopping markets such as the Harris Theater and Whole Foods off of East Campus, we can give sell these tote bags to them. So when customers come in, oftentimes like let's say you forget to bring your recycled bag. It's like you don't always want to spend five dollars every single visit and not all, everybody can afford to be spending five dollars every visit buy a new recycled tote bag, they can give these bags to the customers, which then they can use it instead of all them like 50 plastic bags back to their car every single time they want to get groceries. So that's more speaking on to the uh, local therapy fire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next up, we'll be switching gears and we'll be hearing from Laura Asherman, pronoun she, her, who is a documentary filmmaker and sculptor who's pursuing Master of Fine Arts degree in experimental and documentary arts. Her work has been featured on PBS, Vice, and HBO. Laura's thesis film was funded by the Facing the Anthropocene grant from Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics, explores the boundaries of documentary and fiction, and employs stop motion animation and elements of absurdity to address microplastics in the human body. So, Give it up for Laura. Hello, my name is Laura Asherman, and I'm an MFA in Experimental and Documentary Arts. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about my thesis film, The Dumpster Dive, a hybrid documentary that aims to inform people outside of the scientific community about the human health implications of microplastics. For as long as I can remember, I've been interested in understanding the link between consumerism and the global waste crisis. Last winter, I read an article published by the Nicholas School, co-authored by Rachel, um, about the decrease in plastic prevention during COVID. Um, and that really piqued my interest. And so after meeting with her, um, I decided this was going to be the path that I would take for my thesis project. 
Um, and here is a still from my film, um, and this is in the new Hanover County landfill in Wilmington, North Carolina. So as I began to research the enormous um, and, and very well-documented plastic crisis, um, I grew increasingly interested in microplastics. I was pretty shocked to find out that as much as we know about how much microplastics humans are consuming on a weekly basis, um, there seems to be very little research about exactly what the toxicology is of this um, microplastic consumption. Um, and uh, this is an image that I captured through a microscope um, of microplastics from the from Crabtree Creek, which is part of the Noose River Basin here in uh, the Triangle. So as I'm sure many people in this room have also seen, um, I, I went into a rabbit hole of watching tons of environmental documentaries. Um, and while I always learn something new when I watch these films, I generally just walk away feeling pretty depressed and hopeless. Um, and so I wondered how I could attract people who might be the ones who just straight up avoid these type of films um, to watch my project and maybe start to care about microplastics. So my answer um, is, well, this is kind of in the way, but that's part of my face. Um, <laughs> that's like, um, my answer is to use absurdity and cockroaches. In the dumpster dive, cockroach news hosts Howard Scourge and Madison Von Berman report on how microplastics could have dire consequences for their species' biggest nuisance, humans. Towing the line of documentary and fiction, um, the dumpster dive combines expert testimonial, collage animation, puppetry, and live cockroaches to talk about microplastics with new audiences. So why cockroaches? People, uh, people always say that cockroaches will outlive the apocalypse. And it makes sense. Uh, cockroaches have been around for a thousand times longer than humans. That's about 300 million years. Um, so I figured who better than cockroaches to talk about how humans are destroying the planet and themselves. So the dumpster dive's target audience is people who are like who are more likely to turn on Adult Swim than the Discovery Channel. <laughs> I wanted to reach the section of the population who is aware of climate change and maybe they've even heard of microplastics, um, but they aren't interested in watching those documentaries that are going to make you feel bad and um, you know want to die. Um, <laughs> And then furthermore, according to a recent study titled How Satirical News Im Impacts Effective Responses, Learning and Persuasion, published in 2021, audiences who don't generally watch um, the news are more likely to engage with satirical news. We all know John Oliver and The Tonight Show and these shows that kind of get you in with entertainment, but then um, actually leave you more educated and interested in the topic. So um, they also found that compared to regular news, um, uh, satirical news had a stronger correlation with persuasion and um, positive uh, change in people's behavior. And um, in the case of my project, I thought about how uh, talking about something as serious as microplastics using uh, an absurd framework of cockroach news hosts um, could actually uh, potentially change people's behavior who may not be watching uh, this kind of work otherwise. So I knew that I wanted to use um, plastic garbage as a visual language in my film, but I didn't want to start hoarding all this plastic trash in my apartment. Um, so I reached out to these incredible artists, Richard Lang and Judith Selby Lang, um, who live in Northern California and have been collecting plastic from a thousand yard stretch of beach near their house for 25 years. And so um, this image on the right is one of their uh, pieces 
called, uh, from their Cavallo print series. Um, and they use plastic in really beautiful ways to make all of their art and it's all photographed so they can reuse it and they have this enormous stockpile. So for a week in January, I went to their studio and set up my stop motion animation set. Um, and if you're not familiar with stop motion animation, the way it works is you take still images and then when you put them together, it becomes an uh, animated video and there's seamless movement. Um, so this here you can see I used all yellow pieces, um, but they have every single type of plastic, every color, every type of object, every size, um, all stored away and very well organized. So I used a lot of this as transitions and um, illustrations throughout my film. So I also, on, on top of the playful side of the film, um, it was really important to me to have some real science in there, some testimony of people who really know what they're talking about. Here is Dr. Amari Walker Franklin, who is um, a RTI researcher, Duke PhD, and the author of the new book, Plastics. Um, and you can see we shot this interview on a green screen, and then in the end, um, she is talking into the dumpster where the cockroaches have their new set. Um, here we have um, Dr. Barbara Dahl, who's an ecological restoration scientist from North Carolina State University. Um, and this is shot in Crabtree Creek in Raleigh. Um, and this is where we collected water samples that you saw earlier. Those, that, um, that sample with the microplastics is from uh, this river. And in this scene, um, Duke doctoral candidate in civil and environmental engineering, Anna Lewis, discusses how uh, potentially toxic plastic additives can leach into their surrounding environments. Um, and so I would like to show you a quick sample of the film. Uh, and this is the scene. So I'm trying this around. Good evening, Trey. Sup, Howard? Hello. I'm here at Duke University's Levine Science Research Center with PhD candidate Anna Lewis. Hi there, Miss Lewis. Thanks for having us, bro. Pound it. You're not gonna touch me, right? Whoa, whoa, it's not like that. I'm not trying to get canceled here. I'm an ally. <laughs> yeah. So, Miss Lewis, what are we, like, looking at today? So today we're looking at black fibers that I pulled off of a waterproof fleece. And you're going to be able to see the additives leaching off of those fibers. In this case, it's a strong solvent, but this shows us the mechanism and we can deduce that the same sort of leaching will be happening in fresh water or even lung fluid. Cool, cool, cool. But like, what are plastic additives? So plastic additives are over 2,700 different types of chemicals that are added to everyday plastic products, and they impart some sort of functional or aesthetic benefit uh, to the plastic, like making it more flexible or more colorful. And as that plastic product ages, it will break up into smaller and smaller pieces. These microplastics then have a higher surface area, and then more of the additives are able to leach out over time into the surrounding environment. Word. And so why exactly is this cause for a cockroach celebration? What? This is something that people need to be concerned about. There are 68 additives that are identified as known carcinogens in everyday plastic products, and 90% of them haven't even been studied properly yet. The humans are poisoning themselves. <laughs> Priceless dog. Uh, you're going back outside now, right? Yeah, totally. Right after lunch. I thought I smelled some bologna in your bag. Mm, Mind if I take no. a bite? Um, yeah, just a few more slides. And so if your creative block just goes wild when you're in here. 
you come in here for one thing and you're in different sections and you came out with 15 <laughs> different <laughs> All right, so um, if y'all are interested in seeing more of this uh, silly film, silly and serious together, um, please come out to the thesis film screening. It is on April 7th at 7 p.m. at the Nasher Museum of Art. Um, I will send uh, Zoe and Rachel a link to the Eventbrite, um, and you'll also see several other films from the MFA. So, yeah, any questions? Really cool. Um, by the way, a great way to reach different audiences. How have you got in mind? I know it might this first, is that the first screening that's coming up? Yes. Um, have you got in mind a way to disseminate this once the, once you live on live a bit? I, that's something I'm really open to. Um, typically, my films have gone through like a festival circuit, um, and then that shows mainly to people who are either really interested in film or other filmmakers. So I'm definitely looking to share it with audiences um, elsewhere and very much open to ideas to get outside of the film and artist bubble. Yeah, actually, we've got a plastics conference in Portsmouth in June that has a strong arts based uh, element to it. Actually, it'd be great to show your film there. Yes, absolutely. We should talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I just have a, a, a comment. This it was absolutely stunning. A great platform, a multimedia to uh, communicate a really serious problem. But as you say, uh, with satire, and and I think yeah, just the, the comedy angle, just the absurdity you you called it. I think it just like drives home the message even more. She can't ignore it. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank I you. Appreciate that. Or else I'm already RSVP. <laughs> So switching gears a bit, uh, next we'll be looking at re reducing single-use plastics in North Carolina. We have Christian Lozada, a student consultant for the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, an interdisciplinary clinic at the Duke Law School. Christian is pursuing a master's degree in environmental management with a focus on environmental policy for plastic pollution reduction and sustainable fisheries management. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Zoe, for the introduction. Again, I'm Christian Lozada. Um, today I'm going to be talking about reducing single-use plastics in North Carolina using some law and policy. Um, just a little bit more about me, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, or his. Uh, like Zoe mentioned, I'm a second year master's of environmental management student studying environmental economics and policy. Um, and I like to say my focus is ocean policy uh, focused on plastic pollution and sustainable fisheries management. Um, this picture is actually me last week in Hawaii. Uh, I got to volunteer and do an ocean beach cleanup. Uh, right after this picture, I fell off that rock and twisted my <laughs> um, probably more information about me than you needed. Um, but I previously worked with the Nicholas Institute with Rachel uh, looking at plastic policies in Estonia. I worked with John because he's my master's project advisor. So there's a lot of great opportunities for Duke students here. Um, and one of them is a Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, so it's co led by Michelle Nolan and Mike Longus. They're both uh, lawyers here, attorneys. And the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, their mission is to train the next generation of leaders to solve environmental problems. And provide an access to justice in underserved communities. Um, and some of the speakers in Lori's video were prior participants of this clinic. So, what I'll be talking about is North Carolina in a broad sense, and what we're seeing as far as plastics and plastics pollution. Um, so, first of all, North Carolinas are really important. You may be thinking, oh, it's just North Carolina, but it's actually home to the second largest estuary in the US, uh, the Albemarle Poundlico. Uh, estuary and North Carolina has 385 miles of beach and 12,000 miles of estuary coast. Um, so it offers habitat and ecosystems for a wide array of marine species that are important for the economy and for the environment. Um, but we currently have 61 federally threatened and endangered species in North Carolina. That includes nine bird species, six reptile species, seven species of fish. Um, and they're common that you may know, like the leatherback turtle, the leatherback turtle, 
big line of sturgeon, short nose sturgeon, green sea turtles, and canvas for these sea turtles. Um, if you don't care about the environmental aspect of this, you may care about the money aspect. Um, and North Carolina really relies on its coastal industry. Uh, they have an over $1 billion fishing, uh, commercial, and recreational fishery industry. And that industry relies heavily on making sure that these ecosystems and these habitats are clean and happy. So let's look at the problem with plastics. So plastic debris in particular has a couple of threats to marine life and to human health. Uh, we have invasive species transport that are hopping on these little plastic pieces, and moving about, and that's really dangerous for native plant species and for fauna. Uh, we also see habitat damage when I was in Hawaii. It was very sad to see just how much plastic was in the ocean and like in these coral reefs. We have like fishing nets wrapped around these coral reefs, which is very terrible. Uh, we have entanglement with some marine species. You can see some of these photos here from North Carolina. Uh, we have species just getting wrapped up in these fishing nets. And you may have seen the videos of like sea turtles with straws in their nose. Um, we're also seeing clogging, which is the term for the ingestion of some of these plastics in these marine species. Um, it's very detrimental because these plastics have toxic chemicals in them. Um, so as these plastics break down, they're ingested by fish or birds and stuff like that, um, which is then ingested by us. And that's really scary because we don't know what marine plastics or microplastics have on um, our uh, health impacts. And I think it's estimated that every year there's about a credit card size of microplastics uh, ingested by each person. Um, and in a new shocking study, it was found that there was microplastics in fetuses of pregnant women. Um, so we don't know where this is all going. Um, there's also a huge climate issue. It's estimated that 10 to 13 percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions budget um, is going to be accounted for for plastics by 2030. And in North Carolina, we have a very specific case of sea turtles and seabirds. So seabirds and coastal birds, sea turtles, um, are more susceptible to plastics and physical damage in North Carolina. So a 14 year study found that more than half of the seabird species in North Carolina had some sort of plastic in their guts. And the big problem for birds is uh, plastic bottle caps because they're very pretty in color and they bob around on the, the ocean surface. So they think that's something that they can eat and then they end up ingesting it. Um, and not all the plastics are the same. For sea turtles in North Carolina, uh, balloons are actually 32, 32 times more deadly than other plastics. Um, it was found to entangle them and cause limbs to fall off um, because they're not getting the blood circulation. Um, and it was found that the main thing that's attracting these turtle sea turtles to the plastics actually isn't the look of the plastics, but it's the smell of the plastics. The odor resembles a lot of what they're eating in uh, their natural habitat. So they're going for these balloons and these other plastics based on the smell. So what are we doing at the Long Policy Clinic? So we're working with our clients to develop strategies that reduce plastics at the source. So we have a two-pronged approach. We have a state-level action, uh, which we're trying to identify some opportunities for state agencies to really reduce the single-use plastics and also enforce the polystyrene ban that's in the Solid Waste Management Act for North Carolina. And then we're also doing a local-level action, which is trying to enforce a plastic bag fee here in Durham, North Carolina. And so a lot of what my research has been focused on this semester has been polystyrene in North Carolina. And I will say I am jet lagged, so I may switch off between polystyrene and styrofoam. I mean the same things for both of them. Um, but just from an Ocean Conservancy beach cleanup from September 2022 to March 2023, uh, they found over 92,000 pounds of trash over 106 miles of North Carolina's coast. Um, and the plastics accounted for 43% of all of that marine debris in North Carolina. Polystyrene itself was 70% of all of that marine debris, which is over 5,000 pounds, which when you think about polystyrene, it's very light, so that's a lot of polystyrene. And the big issue with polystyrene in North Carolina is that there's no curbside recycling for it in North Carolina. In fact, there's only two uh, recycling industries in North Carolina for polystyrene, and it only focuses on transportation polystyrene and not the food and restaurant like containers that you get. And there's a lot of threats to polystyrene. So the environmental threats, first of all, we've already talked about Justin, it could cause choking, reduce growth, reduce fertility, um, and mess up some of the juvenile development of these marine species. Um, it also causes this false sense of fullness in them because it's so light and filled with air. Um, so it could end up causing starvation. 
Another thing is that North Carolina landfills are nearly full. We're kind of in a place where we need to look for a little bit of our trash now. Um, these big polystyrene pieces are light, but they're huge, and they're just taking up all the space in the landfills. Uh, some of the human health impacts polystyrene contains two known carcinogens, benzene and styrene. And as it breaks down into smaller pieces, and of course, it ends up in our water systems and our soil and our food supply. Um, and the daily U.S. diet consumption is about three parts per billion of styrene. Um, and workers that work with styrene, they're finding that they're having high cases of fatigue, of cancer, of um, some fertility issues, um, which is really scary. And then another big problem is the climate. Um, previously, the manufacturing of polystyrene was really high in CFCs, uh, which was depleted in our ozone, but that was thankfully fixed. But modern manufacturing of polystyrene um, now emits a high amount of hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs. Uh, which is about 30 times more potent than uh, CO2. And so currently these states have polystyrene gens in place. So we're hoping to look at some of these states, use them as a model for North Carolina to enforce the polystyrene ban that we have here, seeing what the best practices are um, and what their research shows. Thankfully, it's not all bad news. Um, we do have some trash trout data, and some amazing people in North Carolina, like the North Carolina River Keepers, who are installing these uh, trash trouts in urban streams and creeks. And it essentially is catching the trash that's coming in through these streams, these creeks um, in these streams, because approximately like 75% of all the litter in these creeks and streams are coming from roadside litter. Um, and so it's a great way for them to have up-to-date data on all of the plastics that we're seeing here. Um, and by number, polystyrene was the highest item collected um, by these trash trouts in North Carolina. So we're hoping to use all of this research and all of this data um, to persuade North Carolina to reduce their city's plastics. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks, Christian. Really interesting. I'm just curious now, as you're, you know, you're getting data in the premises, that if you get enough data, you can convince who in North Carolina to, to make a change, to change policy. Yeah, not sure how much I'm allowed to say because confidentiality agreement. Oh, okay. So uh, we'll be mainly focusing on getting the governor to Um, what have you seen in other states that have these successful bans that you're trying to implement here? Yeah, well, we've mainly been seeing, uh, so Virginia had a very successful ban on using these plastics. So we tried to replicate a lot of what they were doing with their legislation. Um, but one of the problems with that that we may be seeing here is that their governor, after passing it, their term ended, and then the next governor came in and was like, we don't care about this, and kind of went away with that executive order. Um, what we're seeing just a lot of cooperation between businesses and state legislators and the people. Can I get one in? Yeah, uh, excellent. Uh, yeah, um, polystyrene, styrofoam, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that, that's such a low hanging fruit that could easily go. And all of the states in the states uh, should have got rid of it by now. But anyway, the uh, point being is you're going to use those other uh, policy frameworks and use those as a good analog to put forward to uh, the North Carolina state. What you could also do, um, drawing some parallels with where you were on vacation, I assume vacation, uh, Hawaii, um, I believe they may have, because uh, I spoke with a the researcher there who used uh, evidence of the cost for alternatives and one of the big, big pushbacks in Hawaii was, oh, it'll cost too much. And uh, she found that uh, there were lots of alternatives out there that was comparable price or even cheaper than a styrofoam clamshell. It could also be a jurisdiction that rescinded the ban afterwards, because I know it, it flip-flops in some states, doesn't it? But I think to strengthen your argument and to make a really strong case is, we all know microplastics have toxicity effects on a whole range of organisms. But polystyrene, ranks as one of the most toxic of the uh, different polymers for microplastics. And it also uh, exhibits size and toxicity. And I think you might want to look at some empirical evidence to put forward your case to, to even make it uh, stronger. And then it will be a slam dunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let me we'll sure to include that.
Last up, we have strengthening the evidence base for local interventions to reduce plastic pollution, maybe such as a styrofoam man. Um, the plastic pollution intervention tool. So the presenter, presenters are Coral Lynn, a public policy and economics major and environmental policy minor, originally from Newton, Massachusetts. She's been working on this project since May and is passionate about local solutions to plastic pollution, environmental justice, and climate change. Outside of classroom research, she's also a member of Our Urban Future, Duke's Urban Studies Club, the Duke Undergraduate Environmental Union, and the Momentum Dance Company. Joining her will be Anne Elizabeth Baker, MEM24, originally from Houston, Texas, who's pursuing a master's degree of environmental management. Her background is in industrial design. At Duke, she's interested in exploring the intersections between plastics policy, circularity, and environmental justice. Come on up. Day. Um, so our uh, project is the Plastic Pollution Intervention Evaluation Tool, strengthening the evidence base for local interventions to reduce plastic pollution. So our wonderful research team includes Zoe Diana, Rachel Harrison, Evan Stewart, and an undergrad researcher who is not able to participate in the class. And Coral. And I think an undergrad student. So a little bit about the project. Um, as we all know, there are a growing number of concerned stakeholders responding to plastic pollution at various scales. Um, but we're seeing a kind of a lack of evidence-based data on um, local level um, outcomes of plastic policy interventions. Um, and so that's sort of what we're focusing on uh, with this project to sort of help practitioners at the local level to evaluate both socioeconomic and ecological outcomes of those interventions. Yeah, it's important background context for this project. As some of our friends in uh, fisheries management might know, uh, rapid assessment tools such as fishery performance indicators have been used to characterize the socioeconomic and ecological performances of fisheries, kind of in their day to day operations, um, and looking at their short and long term outcomes. Um, and we chose to kind of use this as a model uh, in the plastics sphere. Uh, because it is low cost, um, generally easy to use by the public and uh, those from government, NGO, uh, research backgrounds, uh, and is still highly effective, even if you might not have all the data checkpoints listed on. So sort of the two goals for this project. First, we are developing a survey tool, um, a rapid assessment tool that will be able to evaluate these interventions locally. And so the way that we're defining local level is anything less than national level. So cities, states, or other community groups. Um, and then second phase is testing and refining that tool um, here locally in Durham. Yeah, so now we're just going to get into the methods we've been using over the past, I think now, year and a half, going on two years. Uh, <laughs> so um, previously, we've been working on, not we, mostly Devin and other members of our team, <laughs> working on the literature review. Um, so kind of the you know, key terms. Um, we've done interviews with local practitioners who are implementing plastic interventions on the ground. Um, as well as data extraction and forming logic models from the articles we screen through the literature review. So that literature review, which was um, primarily led by Devin, um, was using a lot of Boolean search string methods. Um, and I think overall we hit at least 600 plus papers and have kind of brought that down to over 200, um, ranging from 2012 to 2022. And so we sort of have this uh, bar chart of kind of showing uh, Distribution of the papers that we're looking at and published. And so we've also been conducting, as we said, semi structured interviews. Um, so far, we have 10 of those um, with folks um, on the ground in countries all over the world um, to sort of reinforce the data that we're gathering from uh, the review and construction. Yeah, and kind of as we spoke with this morning a little bit at breakfast, uh, we did have. A English language kind of barrier. We looked at um, articles and white papers that were written in English or translated to English. Uh, but as you can see, we still managed to get a variety of interventions globally. Uh, as you can notice, each dot is each 
place where an indicator happened at the local level. Um, and as you can notice, a lot of them are concentrated around coastal areas. So um, before we kind of get into the logic models, I wanted to talk a little bit about the code book that we've been using. Um, so we sort of have um, five different intervention categories, uh, including awareness raising, capacity building, innovation, economic, and policy regulatory. Um, and from those, we've been mapping um, different social, economic, and ecological outcomes and identifying qualitative and quantitative indicators for those outcomes. Yeah, so here we have kind of a visualization of the data that we extracted from each article. Um, so this is a paper by Tapio et al. Um, and on the left in the purple, we kind of have three different um, interventions going on at local level. As you can see, um, it was house to house waste collection, um, training and employing youth, and encouraging households to separate plastics and metals and electronic equipment, uh, connecting directly to those for the social, economic, and logical outcomes in the middle, uh, and with the triangles on the right and blue, you have the indicators. So what um, the researchers used to measure the outcomes. Um, so for example, to measure the strength of economic incentives, um, the researchers looked at the number of plastic-based purchasing outlets in that particular community. So this sort of just gives kind of a higher level overview of where we are in the process um, through literature review, data extraction, um, interviews, kind of time. Um, currently we're developing Continuing data extraction, continuing to develop the watch models, um, and then we move into the next phase, which is wrapping the tool and testing and refining it. Um, and I think the timeline that we're looking at for that is going to be going into the summer. And hopefully that will be done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Well, thank, no, thanks, guys, and congrats. I know I know how far you've come. So <laughs> congratulations on, on all the work. I'm just curious as this is as this is developing, and you've you've been building this out, you've been finding it. As I understand it, you're developing a different set of indicators for each intervention. Is that correct? Each intervention is going to generate its own unique set of indicators, or are there common indicators across all the different types of interventions? The indicators are linked to the outcome. Okay. The outcomes are linked to the intervention. So you will have, there'll be differences by the different types of interventions. Yes, yeah, so there will be overlap. Okay. I was just curious on average, like how many, for each of these outcomes, and in, how many different types of indicators are you are you finding? Is it three, five, 10, 15? How, how large is this survey tool going to be for? Say we're still in progress. Um, I think for most of the outcomes, not more than three indicators for one specific outcome, I would say. Like usually just one indicator for each outcome is typical. Yeah. But that's I mean, at a like micro level. Like that's I think we'll have to do some larger bucketing. Yeah. 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 I also think like one paper might have like 50 indicators. You know what I mean? For 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 one thing they're trying to measure, and, and that's what the paper is about. But I think Zoe's point is the most important one is they'll be distilled into the sort of themes and categories um, after the extraction. Great talk. I love the team effort there and tag teaming. In fact, uh, yeah, the others did that as well. Well done. Um, so, uh, how did you um, uh, recruit uh, your participants and what was the criteria for those 10? And why 10? Do you know? I think we were trying to get like a vast like geographic variety. Um, so we spoke on the phone with um, I spoke with the phone with someone from Ghana, we spoke on the phone with someone who is living in and working in Arizona but has done some work in Ethiopia. Um, oh, so I might miss that. So those those 10 were people who conducted the a subset of the people who've done the studies. They were actually, it was more, we were connected to them through the like breakthrough from plastic networks. We were actually seeking not researchers and, and folks on the ground doing interventions to see if, based on like a, a minimal data extraction, if how we were collecting data and what we were finding was 
tracking of what they were seeing on the ground in terms of the types of outcomes and the ways you might be able to measure those outcomes. Great, thank you. I might have uh, missed that. Sorry, jet lag, I'll blame it. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we have another event Thursday at, is it at noon? Which one is it? Yes. Yeah, we have another event on Thursday. It's a lunch and learn at noon. I think we have limited seating in the room we have, so we might be maxed out for the in-persons based on who is RSVP to be tentative, but, but email me. And there's snacks, please take snacks. Um, thank you guys for coming and thank you to the students for, for putting in the work to, to do the presentation two days after spring break. <laughs> Great job, guys. Thank you all.